Good evening. London councils are playing down concerns of a local lockdown in London following it in the steps of Leicester, despite worries that COVID-19 cases in some areas are rising. Hospitals in almost half of our boroughs have reported an increase, with Boris Johnson warning that the virus is circling like a shark. Sadiq Khan says he needs more information from the government on the numbers here. Here's our political correspondent, Simon Harris. London's riverside pubs should be buzzing. Instead, there were no crowds of drinkers on the Thames Path in Hammersmith this lunchtime. Just warning signs and reminders to stay two metres apart. On Saturday, the pubs can reopen, but it's a gamble. And in some parts of London, the risks are even higher. Hammersmith and Fulham is one of several London boroughs where hospitals have seen a small increase in the number of COVID-19 patients in the last fortnight. It's not enough to trigger a local lockdown but it is being monitored closely. The number of hospital patients testing positive in Hammersmith and Fulham rose by 11. In neighbouring Ealing to the west, infections went up by nine. And in Westminster, eight more patients tested positive than the previous week. And that's before Saturday. We've got a couple of pubs, say, on the riverside at Hammersmith already doing um, off-licence trade. That has led to crowding. Our parks are crowded. We've had unlicensed music events um, in, the, in the last week in the borough. Social distancing has largely gone out the window. In a speech today, the Prime Minister acknowledged the risk. The virus is out there, still circling like a shark in the water. And it will take all our collective discipline and resolve to keep that virus at bay. We now know what a local lockdown looks like. In Leicester, non-essential shops have been ordered to shut barely a fortnight after reopening. But the government has been criticised for not giving local authorities the information they need to judge whether a fresh lockdown is necessary. We need postcode-based data so that outbreaks on a street, on an estate, in a ward can be picked up very, very early and dealt with. We've got no idea either the councils in London, the, the 33 councils, or in City Hall, what the uh, infection rate is, where there is growth, what the uh, local R number is. We've got no powers to enforce or say there should be a local lockdown. Tonight, a leaked NHS email has suggested London's hospitals are on standby to treat Saturday's mass pub reopening like a busy New Year's Eve. Simon Harris, ITV News, Hammersmith. Well, as many businesses do prepare to reopen and slowly start easing back to a new normal, council leaders have again played down speculation about local lockdowns being necessary here in the capital. Following the restrictions placed on Leicester earlier this week, pockets of London have now been identified as potential risk areas, as our political correspondent Simon Harris reports. Halston is one of Britain's worst affected virus hotspots, which is why a walkthrough test centre was set up on an outdoor basketball court three weeks ago. This is an area with one of the highest death tolls in the UK, and no one here wants another lockdown. Never say never. Um, at the moment, I'm feeling confident and I think we're on top of things, but it's really important um, that everybody who has symptoms gets a test really promptly and that if that test is positive, they work with Test and Trace to identify their contacts. In a city, London offered a perfect climate for the virus to thrive. Housing is in short supply. Old and young live together. The streets are busy. You could see that how the street is really overcrowded already and the shops. The social distancing are, are not even still here yet. You cannot see many people really having the, the, PP, the equipment, masks. Brent Council said the situation is constantly monitored, but public health data does not suggest that cases are rising in the borough and there are currently no plans for a local lockdown. Health workers are bracing themselves just in case. Basically, I think there is a potential, and that's what we've been advised, but it's very unofficial advice so far about the fact that there may be a lockdown. It hasn't come in any official capacity as yet. Testing will only stop a second spike in infections if confirmed cases and anyone they come into contact with isolate. But the test and trace system was again criticised today. The updated figures now show that things have got worse. Of the 22,000 new cases of COVID infections per week in mid-June, just 5,000 were reached and asked to provide details. So now three quarters of people with COVID-19 are not being reached. 
How does the Prime Minister explain that? The a test, track and trace operation is actually reaching a huge numbers of people and causing them uh, to self-isolate in ways I don't think he conceivably could have expected a month ago when this system was set up. Brent is just one of several London boroughs where health officials and politicians will keep a close eye on the infection rate as lockdown restrictions are relaxed even more in the coming days. Simon Harris, ITV News. Good evening. It's a political row with school children at its centre. The government's ordered the London Mayor, Sadiq Khan, to suspend free travel for children. It's part of an agreement of a £1.6 billion bailout of TfL. But today, on his first official visit since lockdown started, the mayor said it would be too difficult to implement. And if they wanted to do it, the ball was in the government's court. The government, in turn, blame him for TfL's financial problems because he froze fares. Our political correspondent Simon Harris reports. Declaring a double-decker full with just 20 passengers on board is one way to enforce social distancing. Another is to keep school children and college students off the buses, which is one reason why the government wants the mayor to scrap free travel for the under-18s. But it's led to an almighty political row, with the mayor effectively saying it can't be done. I've told the government it's frankly speaking too difficult to implement. Under-18s living in London currently get free travel on buses and trams. 11 to 15-year-olds are also entitled to child rates on the Tube, DLR and Overground. And under-10s travel for free. Atian Akej is a sixth former from Camden, who's also a member of the Youth Parliament. Everyone should have a right to be able to travel around the city they live in at an affordable rate. And I think there's a recognition that young people don't have jobs and, and that it, it's reasonable and fair that the government subsidise our travel. Scrapping free travel isn't just about social distancing, it's also about money. Transport for London has been hemorrhaging cash since lockdown and the government has been forced to step in with a £1.6 billion bailout. Ministers say the mayor is partly to blame. The Transport Secretary told MPs Sadiq Khan's decision to partially freeze fares and fix the price of the congestion charge had cost £700 million. But it must be the case for members across the House that it's fair that people in other parts of the country are not unduly subsidising the mayor who failed to collect the funds. But the mayor said the minister's maths were wrong and when it comes to cutting free fares for under-18s, he appears to be stalling. If they want me to do it, they've got to find a way of doing it. So the ball is in the government's court to let TfL's experts know a way of doing it in a way that uh, can make it work. You saying it's too difficult to implement and washing your hands, the government's not going to buy that, is it? Well, it's for the government to come up with a scheme that works in London. The mayor broke his lockdown today for his first official public appearance since March when he hosted a royal visit to a TfL depot where Prince Charles met transport workers. The friction between City Hall and Whitehall over money probably wasn't mentioned. Well, you mentioned transport workers at the end there, and there's a, a memorial planned for them. Yes, we saw Prince Charles thanking many TfL workers today, and the government has announced that those transport workers who lost their lives during the pandemic should be remembered on a formal memorial. We know that 44 TfL workers have died uh, during uh, the pandemic from COVID-19, many of them bus drivers in the early weeks. And today, the Transport Secretary Grant Shapps said he could think of no better location for a memorial than Victoria Station, where Belly Majinga worked. She, of course, was the GTR ticket worker uh, who became ill and died from the virus. Uh, continue with talking about, about the virus. We've had news in the last half an hour or so about masks. Yes, it looks as if Transport for London is going to start taking a much tougher line with people who don't wear some sort of mask or face covering on the tube or on the buses. It's now illegal to travel on public transport without having your face covered. And this evening, Transport for London has told us that from next week, its enforcement officers and British Transport Police will switch tactics from instead of encouraging people to cover their faces, it will start to give them an ultimatum if they fail to comply. That means that anyone who's travelling on a train or a bus who isn't wearing a mask could be ordered to leave. People could be refused entry to stations, refused entry onto buses, or ultimately they could be fined or prosecuted. OK, Simon, thanks very much. This weekend marks the 72nd anniversary of the creation of the NHS. Uh, for many, Sunday will be the chance for a final clap in honour of health workers. For others, it will be a reminder of how they owe their lives to those who have worked tirelessly throughout this pandemic.
Well, among them were with Franco Paolo, a nurse released from hospital after more than a month in intensive care. Simon Harris spoke to him about his fight against the virus. Initially, I was responding, but uh, as time passed, the CPAP is not well, uh, is not fitted for me. I was blowing it away and I'm struggling again to breathe. So the decision was made to intubate me and ask me about it. At first I said no because I'm an a and &E nurse. I'll be intubated and I don't want the tube going to my, to my mouth. I'm, I'm very scared that time. How worried were you that if you went on a ventilator you might not survive? Uh, in my mind that time I think no one, uh, even no one, uh, could tell us or predict what would happen. But I am really scared and shocked that this thing is happening to me that time. What did you say to your wife? The last thing that I talked to my wife, I told her that uh, I will be intubated. She started crying. I told her, don't worry, that I will, I will come back. I will come back to this. And... Unfortunately, I, I wake up after five weeks. How good does it feel to be alive? Oh, I thank God that uh, and everyone that supported me throughout my endeavor. And I am very thankful that uh, I am here today talking to everybody. <laughs> Do you remember when you came round and realized you'd survived? Oh, yes. Uh, I was shocked initially because I don't have any voice that time. I got a, a tracheostomy, a hole in my neck, and I, I, I haven't had a voice that time. So initially, when I tried to touch myself, oh, my, my hair is so, so long. How come? And I got a beard. <laughs> What's happening to me? What do you think about lockdown being eased? I think we are in areas, I think we are, too early in putting out the, the lockdown. So people need to be careful still? People need to be very careful about this illness. It's quite very unpredictable, the, the way it will uh, attack your body or your immune system. 